All right, now I have the privilege of introducing and welcoming our opening keynote, Gustav Nilsone. Gustav is an associate professor of neuroscience at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. His work is largely in meta-science, assessing and improving the transparency and reproducibility of research. Gustav is a long-standing advocate for open science and as a senior advisor to the Swedish National Data Service. Gustav's talk, titled The Long Road Towards Open Science, Strategies for Change, will be recorded, but the Q&A afterwards will not be recorded, in case you prefer not to, to have that captured. So please join me in welcoming Gustav. All yours. Thank you very much, Emily. It's great to be here. So, I'm Gustav Nilsson, Associate Professor at the Karolinska Institute and Senior Advisor to the Swedish National Data Service. I'm going to talk about transparency and reproducibility and how we can advance the journey towards the transformation to an open science system. Um, Torsten mentioned the uh, why and the who. I'm going to talk about the why and the how. And I don't think I need to uh, make the case uh, in this audience why open science is beneficial, but I do think that sometimes it's helpful for us to uh, take a step back and uh, reflect uh, on uh, uh, what it really actually means, uh, what is behind the numbers. Uh, Sometimes open science is discussed in a very abstract way, but we're talking about how to provide humanity with uh, the knowledge that we need to make the best decisions. There is flesh and blood under the numbers. And I decided to start with my hand as a, an example uh, of this, because uh, every person I've met in the last few days has immediately asked me, what happened? So now, <laughs> Why not explain it? And in doing so, uh, I'll take you on a journey down the rabbit hole of medical evidence. So uh, please follow. <laughs> this is the problem. It's a, a carpal ganglion. That means that uh, there's a, there was a weakening in uh, the joint capsule and it got filled with uh, joint fluid and started to bulge out. And uh, I got this because I was doing too much handstand practice. Uh, it's not very, um, it's not uncommon, it's not dangerous, but it was getting uh, inconvenient and painful. Uh, so I decided to uh, uh, do something about it. This photograph is from Friday morning when I was on the way to the surgery. So I had a surgeon uh, remove this ganglion from my wrist. It was a planned surgery and it's, it doesn't hurt and it's all fine. But what do we actually know? about this procedure. I went to consult the medical literature and happily there's a systematic review and meta-analysis on the topic of how to treat a wrist ganglion. Uh, as a side note, there's a paywall. So if I had not been an academic, probably my journey towards knowledge had, uh, would have stopped at this point. Uh, but if we look at what they did here, they did a comprehensive search of the medical literature. They looked for all the randomized controlled trials they could find. Uh, and in the end, uh, there were two of them that are plotted here in this um, forest plot, which is not that much of a forest when there's only two studies. And the comparison here is between the two major treatment modalities, which are aspiration or surgical excision. So surgical excision is what I had on Friday and aspiration is when you instead try to stick a needle in it and suck out the joint fluid uh, and then hoping that it will go away. Both of these trials found that uh, when you do surgical excision, that's the, um, excuse me, the surgical excision is the experimental uh, group and aspiration is the control group and there were fewer recurrent um, events in the surgical groups. So here the outcome is quite clear. Uh, does the thing come back or not? I looked up these two studies 
and uh, the results are very straightforward. They're plotted in these two by two tables. This is a quite transparent way to uh, represent the results. It allows anyone to see exactly what the numbers were in each group and to uh, uh, recalculate the statistical test if we should want to. Now, I briefly looked at these papers and I didn't find any uh, big red flags, except there's one thing here that you may already have noted. Both of these studies were just barely statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Um, it could be that they got lucky. Or it could be uh, that uh, they went on until they had a statistically significant result. The Fisher's exact test is entirely justifiable to do with this kind of two by two plot, but it does uh, presuppose that you have decided on beforehand what the sample size is going to be. Um, so if you go back and look here, we can think about these two trials as having been selected from, first of all, an imaginary universe of all the trials that could have been conducted. And if all those trials had been conducted, then we could have quite exactly have estimated the effect, and it would be, for practical purposes, something very close to what we would call the truth. But from this universe of possible studies, we have those studies that were conducted, and out of the studies that were conducted, we have the studies that were reported. And we don't know what the difference is between these uh, two uh, later categories. We don't know how many trials have been performed and never reported. If they had been, would they have been systematically different? Would we have arrived at a different number? Also, I would note that for such a relatively common uh, medical condition, these are very few patients to base evidence uh, at all. I went, before I went to the surgery on Friday, uh, earlier this year I went to my family doctor. Uh, and we first tried the uh, uh, aspiration. He stuck a needle in it and uh, managed to extract some fluid and it shrank, but then it came back. And we had a discussion about this. What is the probability, if we do this procedure, that the ganglion will come back? He didn't know the probability, and neither did I, but we decided to try it anyway. These numbers tell us what the probability is, according to the best estimates from the medical literature, but there are vanishingly few patients in this set of evidence compared to all the patients uh, out here in the world. And when we have so few events, just one event or two events in these surgical groups, uh, it's very... Um, uh, then chance plays a very big role, and we can't really estimate uh, the probability of recurrence in a particularly meaningful way. Here is a stylized example of uh, what I'm uh, talking about with studies going missing. If we imagine here, on the left, a situation where all the studies have been published, then we can reach uh, a reliable estimate assuming that the studies were well conducted. Whereas if the, if the publication is biased towards positive findings and those studies that did not produce a statistically significant effect are not there, then it will look like the treatment works whether or not it actually does. And this, this figure is in here because I want to highlight the difference between the quality of an individual study and the quality of the scientific literature as a whole. Many of us feel that there is a deluge of uh, bad uh, science, poorly done uh, scientific studies and papers coming out, and that we should somehow try to defend ourselves against uh, all this uh, low quality research. But at the same time, the more gatekeeping we have, uh, the less we can trust the aggregate estimates uh, of our literature. So there is a kind of paradox where if we crank up the filter, so to speak, if we allow fewer studies to pass, uh, then we be, will become less certain uh, when we try to uh, put all the findings together and uh, uh, make a summary estimate. 
So, can we do better? Uh, I think we can. Uh, we need to find ways to publish science that don't rely on these gatekeeper mechanisms, but that rather make sure that all the results get out there, whether they're scientific papers or not. And this is something I'm going to discuss uh, more uh, at some length. I have already uh, mentioned these uh, questions that occurred. Uh, so I was asking how many unreported trials are out there for this particular question we were looking at. What did they find and what would we have estimated if all the trials had been reported? And I was arguing that there is considerable publication bias. And uh, or that in this particular case, there may be publication bias because in general, uh, there is plenty of evidence to suggest uh, that we do have publication bias. And here is, uh, in my view, one of the uh, most striking uh, ways to show this phenomenon. So, uh, in this study, they collected more than one million uh, z-values from the medical literature. Uh, the z-value is a, a standardized effect size, and it has the property that uh, over 1.96, or approximately 2. Uh, it corresponds to a statistically significant p-value. Similarly, below 2, it also corresponds to a statistically significant p-value. And uh, this graph shows that in the literature, there is a great preponderance of statistically significant p-values, whereas those that were not statistically significant uh, occur at lower frequencies compared to those that are just over or over the th threshold. This supports the idea that a statistically significant p-value is uh, in some sense a license to publish a finding, a license to build a narrative and write a paper and uh, try to publish it in a journal. But again, if we only publish the statistically significant findings, then it will look like everything works. Uh, all the treatments will cure the patients and all the hypotheses that we have investigated are true. Uh, and this suggests to me that there is a, a um, malady in our uh, scientific publishing process that we need to uh, try to do something about. This is a paper that some colleagues and I wrote uh, about two years ago. Uh, we were asked to do it in order to contribute to the European policy making that was going on at the time. And uh, I'm going to get into uh, a bit of the arguments that we made here about replacing academic journals, uh, why we need to do that and what we could imagine to have instead. And then the rest of the talk will be about uh, strategies that we could use to make a change. So. In this paper, we talk about three crises, a crisis of replicability, a crisis of affordability, and a crisis of functionality. Let me just give a few examples, and I won't dwell too long on, uh, on this, because again, I think this is something that uh, I probably don't need to argue uh, very uh, intensely in, in this uh, setting. Here is one example. It's the Reproducibility Project Psychology, in which I had a small involvement, it came out almost 10 years ago, and uh, in some sense it sparked the debate about the reproducibility crisis in experimental psychology. So here we took 100 studies in experimental psychology and tried to reproduce them again. This was the first time anyone had, did, had done such a large-scale attempt to reproduce findings within a scientific field. And we have on the left, the p-values, the original studies, 97 out of 100 were statistically significant. This already suggests that there is some bias uh, at play. Uh, and in the replications, about one-third were statistically significant. On uh, uh, the second panel, we see that the effect sizes on average were cut in half in the replications. Here is another example. We did a study uh, where we looked at data from the journal Cognition. So again, this is close to the field of experimental psychology. This study was led by a, a colleague, Tom Hardwick. The journal Cognition introduced an open data policy some years ago, and then uh, that enabled us to take their data sets and see if we could reproduce the results that were reported in the papers. And this was possible for about a third of the papers. For the rest, we contacted the authors. And I'm happy to say that in every case, the authors responded helpfully, and then we were able to reproduce about another third of the results. And 
the last third of the results were not reproducible despite uh, help from the authors in finding out what they had done. This was for different reasons. Sometimes the methods were not described clearly enough. Sometimes there was something wrong with the data. For instance, there was one paper I looked at where the data set was uh, in a, a supplementary file. It was a very long file uh, with recordings of uh, physiological measures from uh, infants. But halfway down the file, so I scrolled from the top to the bottom, and halfway down, uh, the data stopped. Someone had made an error somewhere, and half the data was simply not in the file. And I'm sure many of you will have seen many examples like this. And to me, this illustrates that it isn't really anybody's job to check. Uh, we have uh, scientific journals that are supposedly providing an independent quality control, but in reality, they have uh, uh, very few of them have systematic approaches. Very few of them ask the reviewers to actually look at the raw data, uh, and so on. A third example, a study that we did recently, we looked at clinical trials that were registered uh, in clinical trials registries in the Nordic countries uh, and where the sponsors were universities or university hospitals. And we looked at whether the trials were reported at all. And this graph shows that about uh, one in five trials that were registered and that uh, were due to report had not done so within the entire follow-up period. I won't get into the details here, but the uh, WHO recommends that uh, the clinical trial results should be reported within 12 months and uh, there is a considerable scope for improvement uh, to reach uh, that aspirational goal. Crisis of affordability. I also don't need to tell you that uh, scientific publishing has become more and more expensive over the years. Richard Pointer has been an, a well-known open access advocate for a long time. Surprised many people, I think about half a year ago by coming out and saying that he doesn't believe in open access anymore, in the concept and in the movement, and uh, he wants to uh, go on and do something else. I searched for some time to try to find something I could say uh, here that would be controversial, and uh, this is the best I came up with. So I'm going to uh, say that Personally, I agree with Richard, at least to the extent that I used to think that gold open access was uh, the way forward. But I've changed my mind, and uh, now I believe that uh, the, uh, the way that open access charges have increased, and um, the way that uh, the publishers have been able to carry on doing the same thing but charging us more, show that this model has uh, not been successful. And um, these days I don't think we should look to uh, gold open access uh, as the way to reach a transition into a fully open access system. We can debate this after if you like. The third crisis is one of functionality. Very briefly, the scientific paper today still looks like it did back when everything was printed on paper. It's not possible to change it, to update it when we get new knowledge. It's not possible to do very much with a paper except to read it. For instance, if I wanted to get those numbers that I showed you before and do some calculations on them, I would just have to read them and then write them down uh, myself in a separate spreadsheet. It takes a long time to publish uh, research. The, um, the conventional journal publishing model, if we don't use preprints, lies like a um, uh, veil over the entire research front and obscures it for months or sometimes years. The quality control does exist, but it is unsystematic and it's very difficult for a reader to tell when we see a paper what kind of quality control has been done. Even if the journal calls itself a peer-reviewed journal, in most cases it's not possible to know if the paper was reviewed by peers or uh, only reviewed by the editors. We can't tell if, uh, if the reviewers, if they existed, were experts or 
what kind of a review they did, or if they liked the paper, or if the paper was changed in the res response to their reviews. Of course, many journals now use open peer review, which is a great step forward, but they are still in the minority. Being a scientist is still very much tied to being an author on a paper. So if I am an author on a scientific paper, then I am also a scientist. But if I'm not authoring scientific papers, then I'm probably not a scientist. And this um, restricts specialization and it makes it very difficult also to find out who among the authors did what, really. Uh, lastly, much of our scientific output remains inaccessible to those who need to read it. Not just to, to myself if I had not been in a university, but also uh, my family physician and my surgeon who uh, worked on my hand on Friday, they're also working outside of academic medical systems and they can't read the scientific literature. We could imagine something entirely different. If we were to invent scientific publishing or scientific dissemination today, it would probably not look very much like the uh, old printed article. Here is one idea of what it could look like. A system of interoperable digital research objects. We could imagine that we have data living in a repository, code living in a different repository, that the code could be uh, executed to call on the data, fetch it from the first repository, and the results outputted to a third place. We can imagine pre-registrations, data management plans, materials and interpretations living in different places, uh, referencing each other and uh, uh, with clear version control, updating. We could also imagine different uh, ways to perform review and quality control on these objects. Um, I made this figure, but of course these ideas are not exactly new. Uh, people have been proposing things like this for a long, long time. Uh, for at least uh, two decades, as far as I'm aware, probably longer. And yet, we still haven't made much progress. The publishers uh, have not failed to notice that there is a potential for uh, change in uh, using digital tools. This uh, figure comes from uh, the paper with Björn Brems on replacing academic journals, and uh, it shows how several of the publishers have been developing and acquiring services across academic workflows from discovery through analysis, writing, publication, outreach and assessment. And uh, with this figure we uh, have warned particularly against the risk that our research data become owned by uh, commercial entities. We have also warned that research assessment uh, should not be based on proprietary metrics and uh, that there is a risk to researchers' privacy when we are forced to work in digital environments where commercial entities track everything we are doing, what we are reading, what we are clicking on, uh, and then uh, repackage this information and sell it back uh, for evaluation uh, to institutions and also for other purposes that uh, are not entirely clear. Instead, what we argue is needed is to bring back uh, the control of our scientific outputs to the scientific community itself. Uh, we are suggesting here a kind of um, conceptual model where the infrastructure is uh, owned by the uh, uh, academic libraries uh, and uh, uh, our outputs are hosted in repositories uh, that are not commercially owned. However, uh, of course, in, in uh, this model, it's entirely possible to uh, uh, contract commercial providers. Just like we purchase uh, electricity and materials for our labs, we can uh, put out tenders and uh, uh, purchase digital services from uh, different providers as long as the control of the scientific artifacts remains uh, with the scholarly community so that we can keep them open. The top layer here is the community layer where we have the academics and then we have an interface layer uh, where as you can see we have 
both uh, research objects such as data, software, and methods, and also a, a set of narrative outputs, which can be research articles, but also other ways to communicate science to society and policy advice to decision makers, and so forth. So, despite the best efforts of very many actors, progress towards open science has been very slow. We've been trying to make a transition for years and years, uh, and even though uh, there are uh, encouraging movements, we still have a very long way to go. Uh, why is that, and what can we do about it? So here is the almost obligatory pyramid model uh, of Brian Nosek, which he uses to explain what we need for the open science transition. Uh, many of you will have seen this before. Nosek suggests that first we need infrastructures that make it possible for scientists to practice openly, then we need user interfaces that make it easy, we need our communities to come together and make it normative, we need incentives for scientists to make it rewarding, and we need policy work that require us to work openly. Now, uh, I would argue that we have made great progress at the bottom of this pyramid. The situation today is uh, hardly comparable to where we were 10 or 20 years ago. Foremost uh, applications where I as a scientist might want to share something, there exists a technical solution today and uh, they are not that difficult to use either. There's also a lot of policy uh, pressure uh, coming from the top. Large funders, uh, both private funders like the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, and also governmental entities like uh, the European Commission and uh, in the United States, the National Institutes of Health and many others, are increasingly require us to share data and, and uh, practice science openly in other ways. But the middle bit here is where I think we have the greatest inertia in finding ways to uh, align open science with incentives and to bring our communities with us uh, and change expectations of uh, what it is we are meant to produce. In Europe, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment is an example of a, a policy initiative. So this is a very large multinational uh, top-down initiative it was launched by the European Commission and by associations of the European universities. And it brings together any stakeholders who work on research assessment to work together and uh, develop the methods and procedures we use. Everyone who signs up uh, puts their name under a set of commitments, uh, which include things like avoiding inappropriate uses of the journal impact factor. Of course, this uh, phrasing is something that has been negotiated so that it can be uh, interpreted by uh, the different parties uh, in an acceptable way. Um, but perhaps more importantly, all those who join uh, undertake to experiment with their own assessment processes and report back over a five-year period what is going to happen. I think we need to measure what counts. So, in this debate about assessment, and especially in Kuara, uh, it is possible to perceive two uh, different um, possible paths, where one is to move away from quantitative assessment and focus instead on a more narrative approach, where you get uh, experts to simply look at research outputs, use their expert knowledge, uh, and make assessments that are not uh, numeric indicators. The other approach is to develop better indicators. Uh, I tend to lean towards the second. I think we need more and better indicators uh, that measure the things that we want to see. This is very difficult, because every indicator that we develop uh, can be gamed in different ways. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, that is something that we have to try. Here's one example of uh, a university that is measuring things that count. It's the Charité, the medical university in Berlin. Uh, I work uh, in several collaborative projects with them. They have a dashboard on responsible research. And these are several screenshots that I've put together. It doesn't look exactly like this if you go to their website. 
But it, it, what it does show is that they are tracking open science practices in their own institution. Here we can see how many of the papers contain a data availability statement or a code avail availability statement. We also see what proportion of papers contain any open data. This kind of uh, follow-up makes it possible to see how well we are doing in the transition towards open science. Uh, and I think this is a necessary tool in order to uh, support the transition that we are trying to make. The Badges for Open Science Practices are an example that I want to mention because it shows how we can introduce and evaluate uh, a, uh, an incentive or a, a uh, procedure to try to uh, support data sharing. The Badges for Open Science Practices were developed by the Center for Open Science that also support uh, or stand behind the Open Science Framework, as you all probably know. Uh, I was chair of the committee for the Badges for Open Science Practices when we defined the criteria. So the idea here is that if a paper meets the criteria, then uh, it can be issued one of these badges. Uh, and the responsibility for checking whether the criteria are met lies with whomever uh, issues the badge. There's a set of journals that do this now, uh, approximately on the order of 100 journals. And you, if you go to one of these journals, you can see that there are papers that have these little badges in the HTML and PDF versions. In 2016, the badges were first introduced and one of the journals uh, where uh, they uh, first were used was the journal Psychological Science. It's a kind of flagship journal for uh, psychological research. And a study came out, I was not involved directly in it, comparing data sharing in this journal, Psychological Science, to uh, four other journals that had not introduced the badge. And so observationally, you can see that the rates of data sharing went up quite a lot in the journal Psychological Science, but not in the comparison journals. However, other things could have changed in this time as well. The, the journal did introduce uh, better policies for data sharing, so perhaps it wasn't just the badge. And this is a criticism that you could always uh, levy against a, an observational study like this. In 2020, another team, uh, also I was not directly involved in that study, another team conducted a proper randomized study in a different journal, where the papers were randomized to be offered an open data badge or not. And this randomized study showed that there was no effect. This, in my opinion, is a great success story. Not because it shows that we should use the open data badge, but because it shows how we can go about systematically uh, developing and testing new ways to incentivize open science practices. As far as I know, this is the only incentive for open uh, science that has been properly tested in this way. And it's reasonable to expect that many incentives will not work, but we need to try and uh, we need to find out. Um, all right. So uh, let me now say a few more words about things that I would like to see uh, tested and in particular focusing on a quality control system for science. I've talked about how we are locked into a journal publishing model that doesn't serve us very well anymore. And I believe that the reason why it's so difficult to break out of it is because uh, we have no other way to uh, independently assess quality of scientific outputs. Universities and funders are reliant on journals to act as a kind of uh, uh, gatekeeping mechanism so that they in turn can assess which scientists uh, should be promoted and should be given grants. But we can innovate in this area. I believe that we can invent much better, more effective quality control systems. And here are some of the features that I would like to see. I would like to see quality control that is independent systematic and transparent. Meaning, I should be able to have my work certified by someone who doesn't have a conflict of interest. It should be possible to know what they did when they assessed the quality of my outputs. 
it should follow a certain procedure that somebody else could also follow and arrive at a similar result. It should be possible for this uh, system to assess different kinds of scientific objects, not just papers, but also data, materials and code. It should be possible to use this system in different settings. So it should be flexible and it should be possible to take out parts and use, and it should be possible to um, move it. I wrote portable and what I mean uh, by this is that uh, it should ideally be possible to implement it in uh, different places uh, so that the processes can uh, interconnect. So I could take the outputs from one place and go to another place and uh, have them read and understood. To the extent that quality control can be automated, this will help a lot. And lastly, most importantly, perhaps from the perspective of uptake, we need to have the community. Uh, we don't merely need to uh, tinker in the garage and come up with uh, excellent new systems, but we also need to make sure that they are acceptable and useful for the community of scientists. Many of these problems are more or less solved, or at least solved to an extent. Uh, if you go to a health technology assessment agency, or if you go to the Cochrane Collaboration, which performs uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, uh, they have very well-developed systematic tools for assessing quality and the risk of bias, especially in clinical research, but also in, uh, in other kinds of research. We have tools. We have checklists, we have procedures, but they are not being used routinely in uh, the peer review of scientific manuscripts. And this is, in my opinion, a bit of a failure of, of the imagination. The Improving Reproducibility in Science, or IRISE project, is uh, a Horizon Europe funded large uh, collaborative project in which I I'm responsible for a randomized controlled trial of computational reproducibility that I wanted to mention in this context. Here we are working together with several publishers and we're going to randomize manuscripts uh, to have the computational reproducibility checked. That is, if we give the data and the methods uh, to a third party, can they perform the calculations and get the same results? And the end goal uh, that I have in mind here is uh, better quality control systems that can help us supplant the narrative peer review model that we have today. So, this is my last uh, slide. What do we need in order to uh, make the open science transition? I think the way to break out of the uh, prestige model of publishing is to come up with new and better ways to assess quality. Many people are talking about stepping away from the impact factors stepping away from the legacy publishing model, but we need to build something new uh, first that can take its place. And especially on the point of assessing uh, quality and merits. We need to find ways to show that the data exists uh, when we have done a scientific study. Uh, that's veracity. Uh, that the statistical models are appropriate, that's accuracy. That the same results can be achieved by someone else who runs the models, that's reproducibility and that the methods uh, and uh, results uh, are there to be inspected, transparency. We need to innovate on this and we need to test new methods for assessment rigorously. If we do this, I believe we can decouple the assessment of quality from publication in journals. Uh, and this allows us not to bypass the prestige economy of science, but to use it constructively uh, by um, allocating prestige uh, with methods that are better suited for their purpose. Let's see if this comes to pass or not. Uh, now, I'm very happy to discuss with you and take any questions. Thank you very much.